in to Sunday evening worship tonight. It's good to see each one of you here. I was given a couple of announcements to make sure you're aware of. VBS shirts are in the secretary's office. If you've ordered one or you're getting one, if you'd go there after services, you could get your T-shirt for VBS. Also, all the teachers that will be teaching during Vacation Bible School should uh, see Jan tonight for the schedule for VBS. Again, it's good to see each one of you tonight. If you would open your songbooks, we'll begin with song number 375. 375. Before we sing this song, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this song we're singing tonight. Brother Tiddley was in Texas in 1936, I believe it was, close to his old home place where he grew up, and he decided he would go by and see how things were. His family had long gone. See how his house he grew up in, the barn that he worked in, and the yard that he played in was. When we got there, the barn was falling in. Most of the trees were dead or gone, and the house was completely gone. And seeing these things, he sat down, leaned against a tree, and he penned these words. Earth holds no treasure but perish with you. However precious they be, yet there's a country to which I am going. Heaven holds all to me. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter next song this evening will be number 292. And after this, we'll have our prayer. Wow. 
Father, we're thankful this evening for this time that we can come together and for this moment when we can approach you in prayer. We're thankful, dear God, for the privilege and the, the avenue of prayer that we have that we can speak to you, that we can pour out our heart and let you know the things that we desire. We pray, dear God, that we would always pray for those things that are in accordance with your will and that we always remember those who are in need of our prayers. Thankful for this time together this evening, dear God, for these songs and for Brother Jimmy and his ability to lead us. Thankful that your son lives to make intercession for us and that we have the opportunity to pray and we're grateful for the time that we'll spend in your word this evening. Thankful for Chad and for his message. We're thankful for our worship this morning. We pray, dear God, that as a, your people, we would have feet that run swiftly toward you and rather than running to evil. We pray, dear God, that we would take those lessons and put them to work in our lives. Mindful, dear God, of our upcoming Vacation Bible School next week. We know, dear God, that we will have the opportunity to teach and influence many young people and adults as well. We pray your blessings upon that time of study and fellowship. Thankful for the work that has gone into it, the leadership that has brought it about. And we pray that it will be fruitful for your kingdom. We pray for those who are not with us that are traveling today, dear God. We pray that you keep them safe while they're away from us and bring them back to us so that we can worship together again. We're thankful for all the things that you provide us through your word and through your church and even here in this congregation. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark your invitation hymn, it'll be number 316, the conclusion of Chad's lesson this evening, number 316. And now before the lesson, we'll turn to number 83. Number 83. And if you would, would you please stand. <clears throat> One, two, and four. I love to tell the story of
back this evening. Uh, a few people had asked just a little bit about uh, how camp went the last couple of weeks. Just to uh, give you a quick couple of things from that. Uh, our first session, which was of course not last week but the week before, uh, we had uh, nine, of, nine of the campers were from Bremen. Uh, second session we had ten from Bremen, count, counting our youngins of course. Um, and I believe, if I counted correctly, Bremen was third most as far as among any one congregation. Uh, had campers uh, at one session or another from a, one week, we had some campers from Tanzania. Uh, and I believe Brother Jimmy G is going to be coming here, right, uh, August the 4th. Uh, so it was his uh, kids, and Jimmy's mom comes out and, and helps cook for the camp. Uh, so they were able to visit, uh, and, and some of their children were there all of first session. Uh, had campers from the Ukraine in first session. They were happened to be home on, uh, I guess, what you call kind of a furlough. But uh, first session, we had uh, seven restorations. Uh, second session, there were, I believe, seven restorations as well. Yes. And uh, four baptisms, second session. One, one of those was a young lady, uh, I believe about 15 or 16 years old. The other three, uh, I told you we studied Acts in second session, and... <laughs> The, uh, one of the lessons that we had, in fact, it was Friday morning, was on Acts 19. People who had not been baptized properly uh, the first time. So we had three young men uh, that day that decided uh, they were, didn't understand what they were doing. They were too young when they uh, were baptized the first time. And so they were uh, re-baptized. Um, oh, and I was going to mention Scott. Our very own Scott uh, was, was a junior counselor. Uh, one of the sessions, first session, and also taught a, a special class for the uh, boys' cabin. So uh, we, we had two good weeks uh, of Bible camp, and uh, that's the third week of Bible camp this summer for us, and we have we've thoroughly enjoyed all of them and uh, thankful for that opportunity. There's a PowerPoint back there, Jake. I forgot to let you know that. <laughs> it's, it's open. It's just not up. I, at least I opened it. I do. It should be on that far right screen. It's, you're looking at the other desktop, I think. Tonight's lesson is going to be on communication. Just kidding. <laughs> that was my fault. I didn't tell Jake. I, I didn't see anybody back there when I first came in here, and so uh, I just went back there and uh, put my PowerPoint on the drive, but I didn't even think to tell. Uh, Brother Jake. There we go. All right. Sorry about that, Jake. My fault. We're going to talk about what the Christian life involves. <clears throat> it's wonderful to become a Christian. In fact, if we're going to go to heaven, it is through Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus very clearly says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I know that's not popular today. I know it's not politically correct, as we sometimes say, but I can't apologize for that. That's something that we cannot back down from. That is uh, true, and it's not just because somebody says so. It is uh, th this book. There's no explanation for this book except to say it came from God. You cannot explain it any other way. You cannot look at the universe around us and, and come to any other conclusion than that there is a God. There, <clears throat> I was noticing something just, just a moment ago, actually, uh, where somebody who was on Facebook, they had posted a picture of something to do with raindrops and... Um, something, something fascinating about the design of raindrops and what is entailed in just in one single raindrop. And 
the person posting that, ironically, doesn't even believe in God. How you can look at a raindrop, a snowflake, things like that, and see the intricate design and say, well, you know, that just happened, is beyond me. But we cannot and must not apologize for the fact that Jesus is the way. And so if we're going to go to heaven, if we're going to have hope beyond this life, it's going to be through Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so we need to become a Christian. We talked this morning about taking very seriously uh, being honest in presenting the word to folks and make sure that we don't teach somebody any kind of error, untruth, as regards to the plan of salvation. So if you want to become a Christian, you've got, you come to this book that, that, again, there's no explanation for except that it came from God. You learn that there's this man named Jesus who was a man, but yet he was more than a man. He was the son of God. We must believe in him as the savior of the world. We must believe what he says when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We must turn away from sins and give our lives to him, confess his name before others as the Christ. We must be immersed in water to have our sins washed away. And, of course, you know the gospel is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Romans 6, 3, and 4 lets us know that when we obey the gospel, we reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We put to death the old man of sin. We're buried in the watery grave of baptism. We're raised to walk in newness of life. That all is necessary if I'm going to have hope beyond this life. But then, of course, comes the question, what next? And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can fall into a mindset as a Christian, as a new Christian, of, well, uh, I, I'm done. I've done it. I'm on my way to heaven, and, and that's it. Sometimes we can, if we're not careful as preachers and teachers of the gospel, make the mistake of <clears throat> stopping that teaching at the, process, at the point of having obeyed the gospel. Say, well, you know, okay, best of luck to you sort of thing. But there's a lot involved in the Christian life. Again, you know, as we said this morning, there's no way you could cover every single thing on this topic. But let's look at just a few things this evening as to what the Christian life involves. What is entailed in the Christian life? First of all, there's, there's leaving. There's some leaving that is involved in living the Christian life. You've got to leave the old life behind. Jesus says, Luke 9, 62, very clearly, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We understand you don't have to be a farmer to know you got your hand on a plow, you're looking at some kind of point of reference to, to get as straight a line as possible, but you start looking behind, well, you know what happens. It, it gets crooked, and that's exactly what happens to our lives many times. We look back. We're not looking forward, pressing forward, as Paul talks about in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. We're looking back, and our lives begin to get off course, and sometimes very much so because we're not leaving the old life behind. We also need to realize we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. I've, I've mentioned several times before, this is one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so there's some things that I leave behind. There's a, there's a new life. There's maybe behavior that I leave behind. There may be a certain way of, of dress, a certain way of speaking, a certain way of just overall living that I leave behind. Why? Because I am a new creature. I am a Christian. So the Christian life involves leaving in that aspect. Understand, too, that sometimes this will cause division. It's very interesting. We often talk about Jesus as the Prince of Peace, and certainly he is that. And yet it's interesting to note Matthew 10, 34 to 36, where Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now, that's not contradicting the fact that in Isaiah 9, 6, he's called Prince of Peace. It's just pointing out the fact that sometimes truth causes division. He goes on in that passage of Matthew 10 to say, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Sometimes when you leave an old life behind, some folks don't like that. I remember very well uh, when I was um, getting back where I needed to be as a child of God, I had kind of wandered away and had to make some changes in my life, and some of my friends didn't care for that too much. But I was leaving that life and that behavior behind, so it caused some division. That happens sometimes as a result of obeying God. And Jesus is pointing this out. He's not saying he came to this earth for the explicit purpose of causing division, but he's saying understand that sometimes when you follow God, when you leave behind the old life of sin, 
There are folks that aren't going to like that very much. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies. In fact, we could really, if we had more time, we could go look at the big context of Romans 6, 1 through 12. But really, I'm, I'm summing it up in that quote from, from about midway through that passage where he just says simply, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies. He starts off the chapter by saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And he talks about being dead to sin. We mentioned that just a moment ago. Putting to death the old man, burying him in the watery grave, raised to walk in newness of life. Don't let sin have control in this body. There are some things that we leave behind. That's part of living the Christian life. Let's notice, second of all, that the Christian life involves living. It involves living. There's some things that I leave, but then there's a life to live. It's the life that is what we often refer to as living by the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You drop down to verse 13, he says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die, but if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Well, what's he talking about there? It means living a clean, godly, righteous life. Now, it doesn't mean living a sinless life. And aren't you glad for that? We'd all be in trouble. But it means that I'm living a life where I strive every day to do what God would have me to do. When I realize I've made a mistake, I correct it. I make it right. Ask God for forgiveness. Maybe ask brethren for forgiveness if that's the need. And then I learn from it and do better. I'll never forget one time being uh, sat down by an instructor, and it was one of my preaching school instructors, and he, he said to me, I had done something that I shouldn't have done and broken a rule. And um, he says to me, he says, Brother Dalhide, have you, have you made this right? And I said, yes, sir, I have. And uh, he says, have you talked to your classmates? Uh, I, had, I had broken a rule, and, and it, was, it was known among the classmates. He says, have you, have you talked to your classmates? And I said, yes, sir, I actually got up in chapel this morning and, and let everybody know that I, I broke a rule and I shouldn't have done that and uh, that... that I wanted to uh, make it right. And then he said something, and I don't think I'll ever forget it. He says, and did you learn from this? And I kind of laughed. I said, yes, sir. I'll never, I'll never forget it. I don't think I'll ever make this mistake again. And he said, all right. Then that's all I need to know. Well, sometimes we make mistakes. But when we learn that we've made a mistake, make it right. And by all means, learn from it. And move on and be better because of that mistake. It means, though, to live by the Spirit, to live a clean life where I'm striving every day to be more like Jesus. Acts 10, verses 34 and 35, we learn there, and Peter says that God is no respecter of persons. For in every nation he that feareth God and doeth his will, those are the ones that God regards. In, in other words, God is not going to have a, a plan of salvation over here for one group of people or one individual and another plan of salvation over here for another individual or another group of people. Paul argues this very uh, a great deal of the book of Romans is Paul saying to the Jews, he says, look, regarding those Gentiles, if they want to be saved, they've got to obey the gospel. Come to Jesus Christ, obey the gospel. That's how they're going to be saved. But he says, guess what, Jews? If you want to be saved, you've got to come to Jesus Christ. Accept him, obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved too. You're not going to be saved any differently. In Romans chapter, I believe it's in chapter 11, there's a phrase there, so shall all Israel be saved. A lot of folks have, uh, I've even heard sometimes brethren latch on to that phrase, so shall all Israel be saved. And they talk about some kind of millennial reign where Jesus is going to save all the Jews and bring them into Jerusalem. That's not what that verse is saying at all. He says, and so, as in, in like manner, shall all Israel be saved. Just like the Gentiles. That's the whole point of that section. And if you look at it in context, you see that. He says, just like the Gentiles, so shall the Jews be saved, if they're saved at all. In other words, he's saying God doesn't owe you anything. Whether Jew, Gentile, Greek, American, Russian, whatever it may be, God doesn't owe us anything. And he's deemed, before the foundation of the world, that Jesus would come, he would die on the cross, he would purchase his church. And if we're going to be saved, it's through the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and the body that he purchased with his blood is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So we've got to live lives that are in accordance with the will of God and understand that there's not, a, there's not a standard for one person and a standard for another. And that also applies to us when we're Christians. There's not a standard for 
old folks and a standard for young folks. There's not a set of moral codes for maybe the new Christian or the mature Christian. We are all going by the same book, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Christian life involves living as God would have us to live. We talked about living a righteous life. Sometimes people act like that is just totally unattainable. But notice just a few verses from the book of 1 John. Chapter 2, verse 29. He says in that verse, Everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So I know I can do righteousness. In fact, chapter 3, verse 7 says, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. So that, that may bring up the question, well, what is righteousness? It's a real simple definition. In fact, it's almost right there in the Word. It's just doing what's right. It's right doing. Can we do what's right? Absolutely. Now, again, it doesn't mean that we're going to do it without flaw and never make a mistake. We're human. But we can do what is right. Chapter 3, verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. And so I've heard people say before, well, you know, we, we can't be righteous. I need to be careful about a statement like that because he says if you don't do righteousness, you're not of God. Now I know in Romans 3 he says there's, there's none righteous, no, not one. That's a quote from the Old Testament looking at a time when there's no Messiah. And so nobody can be justified. That's one of the key words in the book of Romans, by the way. Justified, and you've probably heard other preachers say the idea justified meaning just as if I'd never sinned. But you couldn't be justified under the old law in the, in the sense of it being a reality, so to speak, because it, the animal sacrifices were looking toward the coming Messiah who would shed his blood for those of all time to have forgiveness of sins. But we've got to live lives that are righteous in the sight of God. Colossians 3 really hits this very well, and uh, we, we don't have time to get in, into an in-depth study of that. Maybe we could do that in a different sermon, but Colossians 3, if you want just a quick summary of it, the first four verses deal with life in Christ. And, and we talked about a lot of this, uh, I believe it was in a Gehi's theme last year. No, it was, what was it, Johnny? Life is God or God is life, something. Life is God, okay. So uh, I remember, and maybe it was just my lesson I talked about Colossians 3, but I, I remember talking about this at camp last year at Camp in Gehi. Life in Christ is, is the first four verses of Colossians 3. That's kind of the idea there. And then you have verses 5 to 9 where he's, he says, you, you know, you have life in Christ, so you, you died to sin. Bury that old man. Get rid of him. He needs to pass away. And that goes back to what we just talked about a moment ago, leaving. And then he says, put on the new man, verses 10 to 17. And that's the, that's the idea there in those verses. You're a Christian, so you've, you've left some things. You've put off some things, the old man. Now put on the new man and behave as a child of God ought to act. And then verses 18 to 24, he describes the new man in action. Some things that we do as a new creature, a new person in Christ Jesus. So the Christian life involves living. Notice third, the Christian life involves laboring, working in other words. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, I love this verse. He says, he, he's summing up that great chapter on the resurrection. He says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We ought to be laboring, abounding in the work of the Lord, not looking to see what, I, what little I can do to get by, but I want to see how much I can do for the Lord because I know that labor is not in vain in the Lord. Notice some things that we could talk about as far as laboring. Uh, show up. Be there when the church assembles, in other words. You know Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 3, 13. There he talks about exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. But how can I encourage or exhort my brother if, if I'm not there? And so we need to show up when we can, when we're able to be there, and we can encourage one another. That's one of the greatest helps in getting to heaven and living the Christian life faithfully is showing up at services, really every opportunity we have, not just because the church is assembled for a, a worship or Bible study, although that certainly is reason enough, but because we, I, I just, I can't tell you enough how much I enjoy being here just to spend time with folks. Maybe it's talking before services. Maybe it's talking after services. Maybe going out to eat after services. It may be a, a fellowship meal, whatever. But 
the being with brethren and encouraging one another. And so there's that idea of showing up. What about, we could say we need to speak up as well in laboring for the Lord. Uh, Galatians ch chapter 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So speak up. In other words, you see somebody who's overtaken in a fault, we need to help that brother or sister. We need to speak up, point that out, and try to help him or her to make that right. Mark 16, 15, speak up in, as in spreading the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, also the words of the Great Commission that Jesus gives. He comes and tells them that all power or authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So we need to speak up for the Lord. It may be that speaking up to somebody who's not a Christian and trying to help them to learn the truth, to obey the truth. It may be a brother or sister in Christ that's gotten overtaken in a fault and I can help him or her to get their life right, uh, back right with God. So we need to speak up as well as showing up. And then the idea of spend up. Spend ourselves in service for God. You know Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth. That shall he also reap. But the next verse, which you probably know as well, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life, life everlasting. And so we reap what we sow. And, and Paul points out, you know, if you... If you focus on carnal, fleshly things, well, those are the things that pass away. But if you focus on spiritual things, the end of that is life everlasting. That's an encouraging thought. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul also talks about there, he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. He that soweth sparingly, well, guess what? We're going to reap sparingly. So we want to spend ourselves in service to God. I read, a, a, an, I can't remember if it was an article or an illustration or something one time about John 12, 3, where the woman breaks the box of very costly ointment and anoints the feet of Jesus, and, and some folks are upset about it. Judas, of course, is upset because, you know, as, as John points out by inspiration, he wasn't concerned about the poor. He says it could have been spent on the poor, but he, he was a thief, and he kept the money bag. But the idea there in John 12 is, yes, it was very expensive ointment. But she understood it's worth it when it's for the Lord. And so when there's an opportunity for me to give of myself, of my time, of my talents, of finances, whatever it may be, I want to spend myself up in service to the Lord because that's what the Christian life involves. It's laboring every possible way that I can to abound in the work of the Lord. Again, because I know that my labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, let's notice also that the Christian life involves learning. It involves learning. It is impossible to be faithful to God without being a student of God's Word. Why, why do we say that? Well, for one thing, we're commanded. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Give diligence is the literal idea there. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. We noticed this morning in Bible class, at the very beginning of Bible class, that 2 Peter 3.18, the idea of growth, and we're talking in our Sunday morning classes uh, this quarter about going toward, growing toward spiritual maturity. But that's not an option for the Christian, for the child of God. We're commanded 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, how am I going to grow in knowledge of God without getting in this book? I know, again, sometimes that's not popular among some folks, but... I don't know any way that you can be a faithful child of God without getting in the book and studying it and, and on a regular basis. And, and it needs to be even more than just whenever the assembled, regularly scheduled assemblies of the church are. How often are we reading our Bibles daily? It may not even have to be that long. Sometimes, you know, we have different obligations, things, maybe it's work, keeps us busy or something. But I dare say any of us, if it's something that, that we desire to do and set our minds to do, even if it's just a few minutes each day, we could spend some time in the Word. I promise you, your life will be better for it if you do that. But we've got to be people who are learning God's Word. The grace of God teaches us. Titus 2.11, this is another one of those verses that, that sometimes you hear people quote, uh, I don't know if I'd say out of context, but they don't, they don't necessarily finish the rest of the thought there. 
The grace of God that bringeth salvation, verse 11 says, hath appeared to all men. Well, that's true. And yet, you, you and I both know from just a cursory study of the Bible that the Bible clearly teaches not all men are going to be saved. Well, if the grace of God has appeared to all men and not all men are going to be saved, well, what's the deal? Well, verse 12 tells us that. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Yes, God's grace has appeared to all men in the form of Jesus Christ. Yes, all men have the opportunity to be saved, and yet not all will be saved. Why? Not through any fault of God's, but because they don't obey the teaching of grace. God's grace teaches us. Well, how do we, how do we learn any subject? Well, you've got to get in the textbook. You've got to follow the teacher. Jesus is the teacher. He wrote the textbook. I took a class in college one time, and uh, I had, you know, the doctor's names on the syllabus who was teaching that class, and then I get the textbook. In fact, I think it was a biology class. Uh, it was at University of Alabama, so you imagine how much fun that was, uh, having this, this evolutionary uh, teacher teach this class. But I noticed the, the guy's name on the syllabus was the same as the guy who wrote the textbook, and I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> well, one thing you can know with our teacher, when it comes to this textbook, he's not trying to make life difficult for anybody. Uh, he wants everybody to be saved. He wants everybody to go to heaven. And it's, as they sometimes say, always an open book test. If we don't know this book, it's because we haven't put in the time to study it. It's not like, as we talked about, we, we studied how we got the Bible. Many times they didn't know the book because they couldn't know the book. They didn't have access to it. It wasn't even in the common people's language many times. I mean, here's the Bible many times it literally chained to a pulpit. And even then, even if you got it off the pulpit, it's in Latin. And you just had to hope you could read Latin. So we need to be people who are studying God's word. God's word builds us up. I love the ending of Paul's speech to the, brethren, uh, the Ephesian elders there at Miletus. He's kind of wrapping that speech up. And, and he says, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. You want to be built up? You want to have an inheritance among all them which are sanctified? Get in the book and study it. What a blessing it is to our lives. 2 Peter 1, 3, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, that's the Bible. It's inspired of God from, from first to end, from gener Genesis to Revelation, I was, I was thinking about the funny uh, Brother Bland used to tell us sometimes he, about the country preacher. They'd say from generation to revolution. <laughs> but from Genesis to Revelation, it's inspired of God. This book's a blessing to us when we study it. Jesus is the Word, so when I learn about the Word, I'm learning about Jesus. And there's nothing better we can spend our time doing. He is the Word made flesh. John 1, first four or five verses tell us, and especially, specifically, verse 14 says, The Word was made flesh. We can know the Word of God. I, I get frustrated when I hear people say, well, can we really know the truth? Can we really know this? Can we really understand the Bible? Yes. Jesus said it very clearly. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. And, and in John 7, 17, he says to those Jews there, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Jesus says we absolutely can know. 1 John 2, 3 says very clearly, and I love this verse, especially for children of God, who sometimes maybe, it's, again, it's one of those things that people sometimes say, well, I don't want to be arrogant. But it's not arrogant to say, I know that I'm saved, that I'm going to heaven. It has nothing to do with me, I promise you that. Because of my own accord, I'm as lost as anybody. But by the grace of God, I can say I'm on my way to heaven. 1 John 2, verse 3 says, Hereby we do know that we know him. But what's the rest of that verse? If, if we keep his commandments. If we're following him, if we're following this book, and it may, that means learning it, we can know that we're saved. Again, not through anything that we've done or accomplished, but by the grace of God Almighty. Let's notice next, the Christian life involves loving. It involves loving. I need to love God. 1 John 4, 19. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. 
We didn't come along and say, well, God, you know, out of the goodness of my heart, I'm going to love you. God extended his love toward us. God commends his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. We love him because he first loved us. Loving him means obeying him. John 14, 15, Jesus said that very clearly, very succinctly there. If you love me, keep my commandments. One of the easiest verses of scripture to memorize. But Jesus says very clearly there, if you love me, keep my commandments. It also means worshiping him. It means worshiping him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. So if I love God, I'm going to strive to do what he would have me to do. I'm going to strive to worship him, whether it be corporately as we're doing now, but also in, in private times. You know, there are times when we worship as a congregation, but there are also times of private devotion as well. All of life is not worship, but there's worship beyond just the corporate assembly as well, and I think we all understand that. Loving God means that I hate evil. Ye that love the Lord hate evil, Psalm 97, verse 10. We've been studying on Sunday morning some things that God hates. Well, God in general hates evil. He doesn't want any part of that. It's completely against his nature. And so if we're going to love God, we need to hate things that are evil. It means seeking first his kingdom, Matthew 6, 33. Jesus says it, uh, again, one of those verses that most of us know, the kids from camp can sing it because it's a song. Uh, we, we know the verse, if nothing else, but from the song. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, he's talking there about the necessities of life. Uh, food and clothing and housing, shelter, that kind of thing. All these things shall be added unto you. If I'm seeking God first, he'll take care of the necessities. I, it doesn't mean I'm going to be rich necessarily, but it does mean he's going to take care of me. So if we love God, let's seek first his kingdom. It also means loving his church. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. Paul says to husbands, you love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ was willing to die for the church. Husbands, he says, you better be willing to lay down your lives for that wife. But it means loving his church if we love God. I, I get so frustrated. I won't say I get angry as much as frustrated when I hear people say, oh, I just want Jesus. I don't want the church. No such thing. The church is Jesus. It's his body. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Can you imagine somebody, men, saying to you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go over too well with me. I can't speak for every man here, but if somebody said to me, now, Chad, we want to have you over for dinner. We appreciate you so much. We just love what you're, what you're doing, trying to teach and preach the word here and, and working with the congregation. And we're so proud to have you part of the Bremen family. We want to have you over for supper. Going to cook whatever you want, get your favorite meal, but we don't want Reagan. We don't want her to come. You just leave her home. We, we're not too crazy about her. Y'all are laughing because you know it never happened that way. It might be the other way around, right? <laughs> but can you imagine somebody saying that? I, I mean, man, how would that go over with you? You don't want my bride. You don't want my wife. You don't want me. Doesn't work that way. That's a package deal, isn't it? The Lord and his church is a package deal. Who can imagine saying, Lord, I want you king of my life, but I don't want your bride. Whew. I don't want to be in the shoes of anybody who would say that. We need to think about that. Loving God means loving his church. Let's love God's word. Psalm 119. The, now, I understand the whole Psalm 119 is, is about the word. In fact, I counted one time. I can't remember. I did this about 15 years ago, um, about 10 years ago that I counted. I actually went through Psalm 119, every single verse, and I counted where, you know, it may be statutes of the Lord, it may be judgments, uh, it may be thy word, or, but every verse except for, I think, it, I think I was able to count on one hand out of about, a, I believe there's 150 verses or so in that Psalm, but I was able to count on one hand, it might have been just a little bit more than that, how many times, how many verses do not mention directly the word of God. The whole Psalm is praising the word of God. But Psalm 119, verse uh, 97, or, or verse 113, he says, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Then you go to 163, he says, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Uh, over and over again, that psalm, he says, I, I love the commandments of the Lord, their righteousness. Uh, the sum of thy word is truth. The psalmist, whether it was David or, or some of the psalms, of course, written by different folks, but over and over again in the Psalms in general, but especially in Psalm 119, the word of God is praised. 
loving as a Christian, living the Christian life means loving God's word, it means loving him, but also loving his word. It means loving God's people as well. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth of the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 Peter 1, 22. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 John 4 and verse 21, he says, This commandment have we from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. If we love God, in fact, John even says in his book there, 1 John, that how can you say you love God whom you've never seen and hate your brother whom you have seen? He said, it doesn't work that way. I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what John says to us. It does not work that way. So we need to love the brethren as well. I want to love God, love God's word, love God's people. I also want to love the lost. Jesus in Matthew 9, 36, he saw those people. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion because they, were, uh, they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus had compassion on the lost. He wanted to teach them. Uh, Romans 9, 1 to 3 always strikes me when I read it where Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And notice what he says in verse 3. For I could wish myself accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. That, that is amazing to me that he can say, I would give up anything. I would be a curse from Christ if it would mean that the Jewish brethren, by and large, would accept Jesus Christ and come to him and obey the gospel. I don't know that I could make a statement like that. But that's the kind of concern that Christ, that, that Paul, rather, had for lost souls. The Christian life involves loving. Loving God, loving God's word, loving his people, and, of course, loving the lost. And then let's notice finally the Christian life involves looking. What do we mean by that? It involves looking for Christ's return. Titus 2 verse 13, he says, Looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Are we looking for the return of Christ? You know, I've, I've heard people say, or I've at least heard it in songs and such as that, such sentiments as, I want to go to heaven, I just don't want to go right now. Folks, I have an idea if we had any inkling of what heaven was like, and if we study God's word, we, we will. But if we have any inkling of what heaven is like, we'd drop everything right here and now to go. Like the story of the old couple that uh, they, they passed away in a, a tragic car accident, and they were, they were both uh, approaching late 90s, and they uh, entered the pearly gates. Of course, you know, that's a, that's a metaphor that we use. But they're entering into heaven, and they're just, they're just dumbfounded by the beauty and the glory of heaven. And the husband reaches over to the wife, and he says, I just can't believe you. And she says, what are you talking about? And he says, just think, if you hadn't have been feeding us oatmeal all those years, we could have been here a lot sooner. <laughs> if we had an idea of what heaven is like, nobody wants to leave this earth. We understand there's a sense in which not having seen what's beyond this life, there's some apprehension. But putting our faith and trust in Christ, we look for the return of him, for his return. We look for that moment when we can leave this life and have heaven as our home. We want to see the return of Christ. We want to see the promised land, the true promised land, not the shadow of it that the Jews experienced, but the true promised land. It's not a matter of when is Jesus coming, but the idea is watch. Jesus is really nails this home in Mark chapter 13. In fact, he, he, the last verse there, verse 37, he just says, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. You know, it, prognosticating and trying to predict when Christ is going to come is, is foolish, and, and it's unproductive because the Bible doesn't tell us. We're not going to be able to nail down when is he coming. I don't, I don't believe you're even going to be able, be able to nail down a, a general idea of when he's coming, and, and that's with good reason because Jesus says, I don't want you to worry about that. I just want you to live your life every day looking for my return. And if we live our lives like that, we'll be ready. I mean, it doesn't matter if he comes tonight, if he comes tomorrow or, or the day after that, or, or if it's beyond my lifetime. The bottom line is we could all leave this life at any moment. And if I leave this life, then Christ may as well have come then because that will be the end of opportunity. It's the point unto men once to die. 
And after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. Revelation 22, 20 says, He which testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. It's not saying he comes quickly in the sense of it's going to be pretty soon. Get ready. It's, it's going to be imminent. What he says when he says, what he means there when he says I come quickly, uh, especially looking at that in the original language, what he's, the idea there is it's going to happen instantly. There's going to be no time to say, oh, look, he's coming. I've got to make my life right. I've got to make some changes. There's no, going to be no, oh, here he comes. I better go and obey the gospel. I never became a Christian. But when he comes, it's going to be quickly, and it's going to be over in a flash. Are we ready? We'd better be ready. But what's amazing to me is Revelation 22:20. 20, even in spite of that, he says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. You know, I often ask myself that question. Can I say tonight, looking at my life and where I am with the Lord, can I say, even so, come, Lord Jesus? I'd love to see the Lord return right now. Can you say that? You may say, I, I can't say that because I've yet to obey the gospel. Well, you got that opportunity right now, and right now is all we've got. You may say, oh, I can't say that because I'm not right with the Lord. There's changes I need to make in my life. Maybe I need to be restored back to faithful service of my brethren. Maybe there's something privately that needs to be taken care of. Well, you've got that opportunity now. Right now is all you've got. If you need to make your life right with the Lord, do it right now while we stand to sing to encourage you. A lot of times we take things for granted certainly we should be thankful for every day that God has given us and we should also be thankful for all the good folks that attend here at the Bremen Church of Christ especially Johnny who led our song service this morning Chad had two excellent lessons today Scott had a good lesson to understand this morning brother Jimmy leading our song service tonight we're so thankful for each of you that had a public part in our worship for those that are visiting with us your honored guests we hope that you can say that it's been good to be here. We'd invite you back at your next opportunity, which will be Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Our summer series continues this coming Wednesday, Lord willing, Brother Aaron Pope 
is that his name, Aaron Pope from uh, the LaGrange congregation, will be here to continue our series of why I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Again, I'll remind you of those that we mentioned this morning on our prayer list. We extend our sympathy to Betty Gray's family, her sister Judy's great nephew. No, it's Betty's great nephew, it's Judy's grandson, seven month old Stone Partridge passed away yesterday. We do not have any arrangements at this time, but certainly we should remember her in our prayer. Are there others that we need to make specific mention of at this time? Again, remind you of those that uh, activities that we have upcoming. Uh, two Brothers Keepers group meet tonight after uh, the evening service, one in the fellowship hall, Robert and Cheryl's group, immediately after services tonight. Uh, group two, Ricky and Sandy's group, will meet at the Higley's home after evening services tonight. Group three meets July the 28th, Jake and Julie's group, in the fellowship hall after the evening service, working on those two projects. If you wish to help, please give your money to Jacob today. BBS will be officially kicked off next Sunday, July the 21st, after the evening worship service. We'll have our annual balloon liftoff and ice cream supper. That will be after the evening service next Sunday, July the 21st. Our VBS begins that Monday evening beginning at 7 p.m. It will be each evening at 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, classes for all ages, including adults. There will be an adult auditorium class each evening. 7 o'clock Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then of course Friday will be our uh, pizza uh, dinner and certificates will be given out. So you're encouraged to be with us next week as our Vacation Bible School continues beginning at Monday evening. Concerning those that are helping, uh, the puppet practice will again be uh, next Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock for those that are helping with that. If you have some cardboard to donate, please get that to room 14 downstairs. And you made an announcement about the t-shirts there here in the office. And uh, give your money to Joyce if uh, you... Okay, and Joyce will be there to give them out after services in Joyce's office. If you have a t-shirt that you've ordered for Vacation Bible School, it is there waiting for you. Have your money ready. And again, we've asked the adults to pay for theirs. The kids get theirs for no cost. Mark, have you had a volunteer yet for the Golden Age Banquet? We're still looking for that for those that are uh, willing to help uh, lead and plan and execute the Golden Age Banquet. Please see Mark Clark for that. That's coming up in October. There's a meeting that begins at Bowden beginning next Sunday, July the 21st through the 25th. Brother Richard Barnes from Smyrna, Georgia will be the speaker at 7.30 each evening. There's a youth rally that's being planned uh, to be uh, executed on uh, August the 10th. That's a Saturday, August the 10th, second Saturday in August in Pennville, Georgia, and Cliff Goodwin is the speaker. Lord's Supper's been kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand this thing, go through this door, second door on the left, and you will be served. And again, we're hopeful of seeing each of you at our next opportunity, which is Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Should we mention anything else? Our final song is number 262. Number 262, if you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. Work for the night is coming. Work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work in screaming flowers. Work in the day grows brighter. Work in the glowing sun. Work.
Our gracious and loving Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to come together with the worship you tonight for the worship we've had today. We pray, Father, that our worship has been acceptable and that we have grown from hearing the lessons today and that we will apply them to our everyday lives. We ask your blessings, Father, for those that are sick, for the ones that are tending to them. Pray for their health and well-being. Ask you to continue with us, forgive us of our sins. When we're failing, we pray that we may have courage to acknowledge our failure. In Jesus' name, amen.